Hello and welcome back to Boring Dad Gaming, where today we're going to be playing some more Road Warden. Uh, we're going to jump right into our save, which loads immediately, I'm happy to say, that's pretty cool. Um, so we've um, we've gone through the ruined village, we stopped at a mysterious tree and uh, tasted it. <laughs> I'm not sure why. Um, that was a bit disgusting. Um, but anyway, we, we've carried down the road and we're now at this new village, so we're going to go and find out what's going on here. You slow down. Among the shrubs, a small pack of drag dragonlings is feasting on the carcass of a grey auroch. One of them, with red feathers on its arms, straighten up, straightens up and gives you a curious glance. Its head tilts left and right, forward and back. It screeches at you, but doesn't move forward and returns to its meal. You wonder what would happen if you were on foot. Would they let you be, satisfied with their prey? Or run after you? But if so, for what reason? For now, you have enough space to move forward, yet stay safe. The powerful jaws break the monster's bones loudly, then bite off and swallow chunks of meat. I ride forward, but I keep my distance and look over my shoulder. The beaten road serves your palfrey well. The forest to your left becomes sparse and brighter, and there are dozens of human-made paths among the fruit-bearing trees. On your right, there's a large pasture with at least a dozen massive mouflons. And I don't know what a mouflon is, but if anyone knows, please tell me in the comments. <laughs> Two of them, already sheared, look comically small. Soon after that, you ride alongside vast, flourishing fields filled with rye, still green, preparing itself patiently for the second harvest. The path ends with a massive wooden gate. The stone wall separating you from the glow of lights behind it isn't as tall as the roofs, but you can't imagine climbing to its top. There are pretty much no cracks, no missing bricks, a sign of many hours of labour, especially considering how massive the settlement is, as wide as a city district. The birds and monkeys are now just a distant echo, replaced with the sound of carts, running, hammers, saws, laughter and shouts. Um, finally, maybe I can rest here. Is it getting on towards evening? So, our larger plan is to um, do, a, do a bit rest and then go back to the ruined village where we're going to meet up with um, that crazy old codger. I, can't, I, don't, I don't know if he even told us his name, but uh, we're going to escort him then to back to the inn. And hopefully we'll get paid for it. But we, we can see how much we can get done here. A young man is leaning against the closed gate, covered by its shadow. He's young, tanned, and has a short, elegantly trimmed red beard. Beneath the green gambeson he wears an expensive tunic decorated with colourful trim. From his arm hangs a steel helmet, though the metal is so thin that it's mostly made of wool and leather. He moves into the light and takes on the posture of a disciplined soldier, not a mercenary. He's standing upright with his chin up. There are two weapons on the ground leaning on the wooden beams at the gate. An axe made of steel and a wooden club. He doesn't reach for either. You dismount smoothly, still having some vigour left. We're very, very hungry. We need to get some food. Uh, Roach holds his tail high. A narrow path leads north towards two field workers, one with a hoe and one with a pitchfork. They wave to you. You can't see their faces, but their clothes are simple. Grey pants and vests made from hemp and wool. Um, I think I think we're quite a friendly road warden, so why don't why not wave back? They talk for a bit, looking towards you and pointing at your mount, then walk away, disappearing behind the wall's corner. The guard smiles, yet avoids your eyes, and has to clear his throat before he speaks. Uh, welcome, traveller. If you're... Nah here? What does that mean? I think that might be a typo. Welcome, traveller. If you're here to make trouble, Howler's Dell welcomes you. Ah, uh, it's, it's a no, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I get it. Okay. Welcome, traveller. If you're near here to make trouble, Howler's Dell welcomes you. We have the whitest flower there is. I don't know what accent he's doing. When he bows, you realise it's a well-practised performance. If it's new garments you're looking for, you can order everything you need right here in all colours, shapes and sizes. Capes, boots, vests, robes. Or if you're a master of the needle, I can assure you we have the fabric you're looking for. His act is over and he glances at your mount in a moment of silence. His eyes get wider as he observes it with a childlike fascination. Uh, we could be friendly or businesslike. Let's be friendly again. This is Roach. Uh, it helps me patrol the roads. You can pet its side if you want, but no sudden movements. 
He follows your instructions, even though your palfrey pays no attention to the man's careful touch. The guard grins widely. I'm so boring, your new road warden. I want to see your mayor. A city folk, eh? The mayor is busy, but I'll ask her. Give us a moment to let you in. He knocks at the gate, which is then pulled inwards by two other guards, a man and a woman, wearing their own gambesons, similarly green, but tailor-made to match their figures. The nearby buildings are simple houses made of wooden beams and covered with thatch, while the storehouse is even more modest, with a roof made of planks. The watchtower has a ladder made of ropes and sticks, but no stairs. Just give me a moment! The guard strides... I don't know if I characterised him properly. The guard strides away before he finishes the last word. The others have closed the gate behind you and observe your mount carefully. Your eyes run east to a humming creek running through the centre of the village. I wait for the return of the messenger. Calming sound, I. Eh? That's Howler's Creek. <laughs> Apologies for the dog in the background. Um, the guard, like most of the locals, is taller than you. Why, but shallow, that's near been a flood in years. Pa told me there used to be near bridges. Neighbours were crossing it with boots in their hands. And it's clean like a raindrop, but there aren't any many fish. <laughs> we're the cleanest village in the north, her companion chuckles brightly. When the guard returns, he's still alone. Uh, she can he come now. A friend of mine is in labor, eh? The mayor wants to be there when the child arrives, but I was asked to show you the village. I nod. Fine, I might change his voice in the next screen if he's still here. Let's pretend it's the second guard. He approaches the watchtower. Tie your mount here, we'll keep kids away. Most of the neighbors are getting ready to celebrate. Once you're done, Oh no, once you're done, he grabs the rope ladder. The view from up there is gorgeous. Uh, I'm not going <laughs> to suspect him of a trap. I climb after him. I mean, this sort of naivety uh, may get us killed at some point. Um, but I think in these circumstances, it's fair enough. Even though the ladder swings in all directions, the guard gets to the top quickly, like a monkey climbing up creepers. You, on the other hand, need to make stops and wait for the ladder to calm itself. When you join the man on the wooden platform, you're a bit dizzy. He's leaning on the wooden parapet, observing the area with a smile. I look around. See, there's no place like Howler's Dell. The guard points in every direction, giving you no time to contemplate. The next few minutes he describes the fields and their crops, the flocks in the pastures and the shepherds inspecting the fences. The ancient garden of trees and bushes, larger than the village itself. The sunlight dancing on the stream to its own tune. If you were to believe everything he describes, this place has access to everything in abundance. The sweetest honey, the most fragrant bread, the softest wool. In the beer, it is excellent. He sounds like a city merchant who's trying to sell an old house. What an annoying kid. Okay. <laughs> what an annoying guard. Near Hovlevan, you could find five larger and richer settlements in less than two days. Uh, no wonder he's so proud. Why wouldn't he be? They've tamed this scrap of land. Well, yeah, why not? I mean, it's... Uh, Fairly prosperous looking town compared to what we've seen so far, right? The islet in the middle connects both parts of the village. According to the man, the northern gate is hardly ever opened as it leads nowhere now. Near the eastern gate, there's the Ape Ale Inn where you can find a bed and victuals. And there's, there's the stall where Akakios rewards our work unless we annoy him with pointless talk. <laughs> On the opposite side of the creek, there's another white house. It belongs to Bion, the best clothier in the north. The priests live in the southeast near the wall, but they do not talk to strangers. You also hear the hunter, about the hunter, the cooper, the fisher, the miller, the pie maker lives with his sister, the baker, the smith and her husband, the smith and her husband, the carpenter, live with their kids. Okay. Some complicated family trees going on there. Some of the larger buildings could accommodate two, maybe even three generations at once. There could be more than a hundred dwellers here. You consider stopping his speech, but he suddenly points at the islet again. There, see? The mayor's coming, the one wearing purple. You're free to join her, traveller. I nod and climb down. You try to get down quickly, but two steps are enough to make you sure that it's a bad idea. You wait for the ladder to find its balance, and you're relieved when you touch the ground again. You untie your palfrey and follow the guard. 
You pass a small pasturage surrounded by a wooden fence, a few loose chickens and a tethered boar. The fancier buildings are covered with whitewash coating, surrounded with vegetables, herbs and flowers. The bridges are wide enough to carry even a wagon, but for Roach walking on the wooden beams is far from pleasant. The eyelet is empty, but you notice an empty stall painted with the shapes of colourful flowers. I walk over the second bridge, so yeah, so we've crossed over to there, I think. Along the entire path, you notice more and more people observing you, smiling, or, or casually greeting you as they're focused on their own tasks. Finally, you reach the main square. A large tree grows in the centre, uh, surrounded by dark water, held together by a thin wall, perfect for sitting. But the smell coming from the liquid makes you think of rotten eggs. The plant reminds you of the tree you saw in the south, next to the swamp altar. Well, I'll try not to lick this one. In the north, you see the a Pale Inn. Judging by the tables, stools and benches outside of it, it's open for guests. The villagers are chatting and dining loudly and you catch their curious glances. On the side of the dining area, the merchant is arguing with a tall, broad-shouldered worker. An old man is sitting by himself, eating a pie, with a walking stick leaning against the table. A young woman is cleaning the empty mugs in the creek, speaking with a man at least twice her age, maybe her father. I need a spot to tether Roach. There's a wide wooden roof right next to the gate that shelters carts, crates and sacks. You move your mount next to a donkey. You move your mount next to a donkey, to a beam placed here just for this purpose, okay. Uh, without a moment of hesitation, Roach starts to chew on the nearby haystack. You have some time to make sure it doesn't struggle with your bundles. You return to the inn. Okay, so I'm going to look for the mayor and approach her. She's sitting on a chair with a four-year-old boy on her knees. She's holding his hand gently, showing him how to eat gruel from a bowl. It's not a cheap meal, though. You spot nuts, berries and milk, and the added honey makes it yellowish. The kid is clean and quiet, and once he notices your arrival, he crams his mouth with a spoonful of oats. Now, now, love, the mayor titters. Do not get distracted? She rubs the meal off his face. A few more spoons and you'll go help Papa in the kitchen, eh? She gives you a radiant, though apologetic smile, then turns her attention back to her companion. I observe her more closely. Her long, full-sleeved linen dress must have been dyed once in blue and once in red to achieve its dark, fancy purple, which would draw looks even in Hovlevan. From her left shoulder hangs a green woolen cape as thin as a shawl. The brown belt on her waist has a large buckle that portrays a running deer with unrealistically large antlers, growing in all directions like tree trunks. Unlike her tribesfolk, she's pale, with powdered and rouged cheeks, and her lips match her outfit, though they're a bit closer to wine red. The grey, thick strands on her long blonde hair look more like a fashion choice than a result of ageing. Her eyes are the colour of her cape, keen and vigorous. She's shorter than most people around, though she would still be the tallest woman in most northern settlements. While she's around 40, her slim hands add fragility to her appearance, even though her posture is upright, her legs confidently crossed, and her delicate voice assertive. She makes plenty of gestures, but her shoulders hardly ever move. Um, I think we should probably show some respect, so let's uh, wait for as long as it takes. After a few more minutes, the boy lets out a gentle cough, and after a pat on the back, the mayor puts him on the ground. You did a great job, love, but now I need to speak with our guest. Darling... She addresses one of the inn-workers, a girl close to fifteen. Take him to father, will you? Her tone suddenly gets firmer, leaving no hint of a question or suggestion. Yes, ma, she responds. Both her hair and her eyes are nothing like those of her brother, and neither of the kids resemble their mother. So we have a road warden again. Please sit down. She shows you vaguely the palm of her open hand, letting you pick any place you want. Okay, so we could choose to sit next to her as a guest, or opposite her as a tray partner. I'm going to sit opposite her. You have a good look at the inn's front door, leading to a cellar-like ground floor. It's dark, with crates and barrels covered with fruits, nuts and vegetables. The actual inn is upstairs, but the only people who go in or out are the workers, most of whom are teenagers. The mayor observes your outfit carefully, maintaining a polite, though cool, smile. Once your eyes meet, she hardly ever looks away. I'm sure you're hungry. My husband will bring us something soon. Uh, I appreciate it. I'm not going to volunteer to pay if she's not asking for it. Don't mention it. Hunger makes me peevish, and the day is too nice for that. 
She taps her chest and looks at a flock of birds that fly above you loudly, heading south. As we're waiting, be so good as to help me understand something. Even if you're but a mercenary, I can not imagine a single reason for you to choose this realm for your wardening. Nis, so along after Asterion's disappearance, there's near glory or treasures to find here. Her pale fingers form a tent on her stomach, then clasp, leaving the forefingers pointing at you. You were sent here by the merchants. They want the peninsula. Um, we could present it as a business opportunity. Or be neutral. We could threaten her. <laughs> or we could be desperate and weep. Um... Let's be friendly and uh, present it as an opportunity. You introduce yourself and touch on the more obvious sides of the potential deal with the guild and the city chief. The troops, their pay and the patrols they would establish, the overview of taxes. Trade routes would bring new life to this place. You try to sound warm. It's a win-win. Throughout your speech, the mayor observes you patiently, without interruption. I see, she finally responds. As she observes your palfrey, she twists her deer buckle left and right, left and right. If it was that simple, I'd be eager to applaud, but it never is that simple, is it? Her eyes fill up with melancholy despite her smile. I appreciate that you're coming with a carrot, not a stick, but when it comes to the guild, there's always a catch. Her accent is now almost identical to the one used in the city. Of... Okay. Sort of a catch. I'm telling you everything I know. Trust me. We can be balanced about it. Yeah. Oh, I wouldn't dare to trust some coin-hoarding trolls. She laughed at her own joke. They would devour the walls that defend them if they could. And I know some of the dirty tricks they use. Here, listen to this one. She theatrically clears her throat, patting her chest with one hand and covering her mouth with another, then leans forward and rests on her elbows, allowing her hands to freely make gestures. Um. Okay, she's pretending to be a different character, so I might just keep it as her voice. You make a deal with the settlement, flour and wool in exchange for coin and tools. You send the first traders and they imply that you're ready for, to pay for more. More pay more for, let's say, parchment. Months later, you want no more rye, just the parchment and wool. We can't here butcher any more mouflons, the locals say. Don't worry, you answer. We'll send you a small flock. Just turn a field of yours into a pasturage. As she pretends to be different characters, her voice comically shifts, and she has no issue switching between accents, unlike me. Um, keep a straight face. She swings her hand above the uh, table. Another year goes by, and while there's more parchment, the village lacks some crops. The tribe n needs not just tools and coins, a lot of coins, but also seeds. And the guild is not satisfied. Sending our wagons costs a lot, and there are more highwaymen now. If you want us to come again, you need more mouflons and to sell us their cheese. And guess what? She says with a haunting laugh. She straightens up and spreads her arm like someone a third her age. Turns out that the village can't say no anymore. They lack supply, seeds and land. They can't refuse. I nod, she's right, and it's better not to say anything stupid. Um, I s yeah, she's, she's right, maybe. The pause doesn't linger for long. I see we understand each other. Let's finish the introductions. I'm Tice, one of the keepers of the Ape Ale Inn, and the mayor of Howler's Dell. I assume it would be convenient for you to take my answer back to Hovlevan. She wonders for a moment. Say, when could we expect the first caravan? After winter? That depends on what you can sell, and what you want in return. While the conversation goes on, the food gets served. The refreshing aroma of roasted mutton, covered with a thick sauce made of mint, parsley and honey, tempts you to bite in right away. The juices are sinking into the round trencher, a plate made of simple brown bread. There's also a small bowl filled with chopped red radishes and a sliced boiled egg, and a mug filled with cold buttermilk. Sounds quite nice. It's all brought by a few young people, all of them referring to the mayor as their mother. And in the end, the innkeeper shows himself shows up to wish you a good meal. He's wearing a clean orange tunic and a not-so-clean apron made of hemp. He politely introduces himself as Eric's, and after confirming you won't get sick from what he prepared, he leaves you and his wife to your conversation. 
Tais tears the meat into smaller pieces, then eats slowly, often expressing her enjoyment with a hum. Meanwhile, we get to the important stuff. Sounds like the ground, nearby ground is fertile. The village would gladly pay its taxes in grain and vegetables, with the expectation that a squad of soldiers would provide additional protection. Our youth is strong, she claims proudly, so we don't need your guards on our walls. But a lone road warden won't keep the roads passable. We need fighters willing to patrol the paths, maybe even the heart of the woods. That's what we'd expect in return. You're not an expert when it comes to linen, cheese and wool, so the mayor spends a good couple of minutes describing the outstanding quality of what the village has to offer, especially the clothes, which are meant to be as unique as those made by Master Crispus. You recognise vaguely the name of this tailor shoemaker, but you've never earned enough money to pay him for as much as a single sleeve. And of course, we will never reject some steel and bronze. We lack alloys for sickles and scythes. She then repeats her question about starting a trade route. Uh, truth be told, the guild is not sure what the peninsula has to offer. It's going to take more than your village to convince them. Understandable, but you won't find much in the other tribes. They have barely enough to survive, even after they trade for our crops. For we have the only decent soil in this realm. At least the people of Gale Rocks have salt and barrels of fish, while Creek sells meat and wood. Actually, if you haven't been in Creeks yet, the farthest village in the northeast, you could give them a chance. She nods with a smile. They could use your help keeping their roads safe. White marshes, on the other hand, as well as old Pagos, are close to worthless. For a trade route, that is. She clears her throat. After these words, she stands up, walks to another table, and offers her trencher to an elderly man who sits there by himself. With a trembling voice, he thanks her, then starts to chew on the soggy bread. She sits down, wipes her hand into a clean cloth, adjusts the fold of her cape, and once again crosses her legs. So, tell me, Sir Boring, how's Hovlevan? I haven't gathered much news since the invasion. Uh, things stay humble, but start to look brighter. Sometimes better, sometimes worse. It's far from great. Um, I think we take the middle path, perhaps. And I was afraid it was lost to hunger. Her chuckle is trimmed with scorn. Good to know I was wrong. When the invasion started, some merchants were cheering in their houses, happy that they would sell out all the blades and food they'd stored. Can you believe it? This panic will make us rich. She imitated... Well, I didn't imitate the voice of a pompous man, but apparently she did. That's why when the southerners reached the villages, they found almost nothing to eat. She sighs. <sighs> Staying in a remote peninsula truly can be a blessing. She pauses, hesitant to go on, then shakes her head slightly. Well, we can't change the past. How can I help you, Sir Boring? I'm looking for a stereon. She stares you in the eyes and then turns towards Roach. Is your palfrey a mare? We have two jacks. Could use some mules. Uh, a stallion, so it won't give you anything stronger than a hinny. Whatever a hinny is. So I've heard... Her eyes wander over the square. That the small donkey bellies bring weak offspring to horses. Her pale fingers reach for her own stomach. When her eyes return to you, they regain their sharpness. I'd rather avoid long talks about that man. Let him remain as part of the past spring. Since you're asking about him, I can only assume he was indeed sharing his goal with you. I won't deny that. Yet you're already different from him. I like it when travellers don't try to sell me blue grass. Seeing your frown, she waves it off. It's just a saying. His words were stronger than his deeds, and he's no longer welcome here. What are his wrongdoings? If you have to know, he failed and won't get a second chance. He was meant to escort Egidia, a daughter of mine, to her betrothed in the Gale Rocks. She was a great archeress, and the road from here to the coast is not that dangerous. When they saw goblins on the road, Asterion ordered her to push through, right into their trap. She touches her deer-shaped buckle. They got jumped like a bunch of wealthy pilgrims. A road warden worth their gruel should know better. He can fight with a blade, but my girl, she never had a chance. She sighs and looks at the gate. He disappeared soon after his pitiful attempt at apologising to me, and we closed our doors behind him for good. I'll let you know if he ever tries to return. Did you ever find your daughter? For a few breaths, her green eyes seek something in your face. Her words are careful, yet hesitant. 
She's with the fox now. The goblins were after food, so they carried her shell away. One day she's going to charge at our walls, awoken and empty. Even though she was a bit mawkish, her heart was strong and patient. She listened to people, was ready to help them and to cry with them. I could tell you stories, but for what? Let the dead rest. Yeah, there's where I can look for him. She adjusts her cape with an annoyed shrug. Try asking for him in the north. He spent most of his time between white marshes, gale rocks and creeks. Here, he wasn't that eager to share his plans. Uh, thanks for the help. I wonder, back in Hovlevan, have you spent any time on Backward Corner? It used to be this dark, dirty alley with muggers working even in daylight. I stayed there with Octavia the Miller in exchange for doing chores for her. She had this small wooden hut. See, I don't know what's true. <laughs> None of these suggest I'm lying. Maybe I can make it true by what I say. Um... Doesn't sound like it probably ended well for them. Let's say there's no such street anymore. You tell her about the riots that happened two years after the invasion, led by hungry, ill people with no place to go. You describe briefly the streets that have risen from the ashes, but it doesn't spark her interest. I can't say I miss that place, but it's weird to think that such a strong memory is no longer a part of reality. Like a tree that you've walked by a thousand times, and one day it's been cut down. She sits silent, absently observing your lips. Uh, have you heard of the necromancers? She taps her fingers on the table. Yes, I have. After you ask her to tell you more, she seems to regain her confidence. You mean White Marshes, for sure. I don't know all that much about what's happening there. We avoid their lands if we can. She frowns. I shouldn't gossip about it with strangers. We can talk about it on another occasion. I was in the ruined village south of here. Her tense gaze shifts into an awkward click of her tongue as she leans away from you. I don't even want to think about their tragic fate. No one can negotiate with the wrath of the herds. A long pause. And I better not find you upsetting my neighbours with these said questions. Sad questions. It was a challenging time for all of us. A wound we won't forget. What do you think about the scavenger who was here before? Ah, he's still alive, she said with distaste. He brought us some news from the north and paid off his debts to us. But he's an idler and a prattler. Drinks too. The further away he stays from here, the better. Uh, we could ask about Glaucia's band. When you mention the raids in the northern villages, her eyes narrow. Are you sure? It's the first time I've heard about it. Glaucia's been around since years back, but she's not much of a nuisance. I'm just a messenger. He asks you to join forces with him. Well, I can't give you my answer. I won't ask our hunters to endanger their lives in the pursuit of some gossip. I could ask around, learn some more. She sighs with exaggerated relief. Oh, what a splendid idea. There are only three villages in the north. White Marches, Marshes, further north by the Western Road, Gale Rocks by the northern coast, and Creeks in the Far East. Bring me news from those places and you will get my answer. Let's just agree to do it. We're going to be travelling to all those places, hopefully, anyway. Tell me, how do people dress in the city these days? Is it similar to what we have here? Before the war, the merchants were wearing these really long dresses and robes. Way too long for my taste. They got mud stains after every rain, and I see no reason to keep shoes completely hidden. <laughs> um, we can say uh, there's a shortage of fabric. Sounds like there probably is. Most people wear tunics like the old days. At least we can hope that if the visitors arrive, we won't stand out much. She laughs, but also adjusts her dress, drawing your attention to its superb quality. And who knows, maybe our little village here is going to help those unfortunate clothiers. I'm sure we could spare a couple of sheets of fabric. I saw a weird tree south of here with the altar. She straightens and ra up and raises her chin. You mean Beholder, the guardian spirit of our wetlands? Every fall we bring it our gifts, and in return it provides us with its blessed fruit, the flesh of the forest. She stares into your eyes. It's older than the oldest books and the oldest thoughts. The druids help us honour its sleep and show us how to ask for its help. Neither of these rituals, she scoffs, would be of use for you. What about if you lick it and chop off a bit? <laughs> I hope it doesn't... 
I hope it doesn't affect this village. Um, what's your secret? She reaches for her buckle and her voice grows cold. There's no secret, Traveller. There's hard work, risks and sacrifices, and the support of those that care about me. The good things that happen to me shine on my people just as much. Think about it before you mention it again. She adjusts her cape. Uh, well, tell me about your village. It is what it seems like, the greatest village in the far north. She raises her hand and makes an inviting gesture. Though I hope this will improve this and that. She winks at you, but it is suddenly interrupted uh, by the pain to cry of a little boy who hurt his knee during a fall. As an amused elder tries to calm him down, the mayor shrugs it off and titters and then meets your eyes again. Life's good here. We have what we need and a lot of what we want, building on top of more than 12 generations of hard work and bravery. She spends a good few minutes telling you about mouflons, which I think must be like sheep. Wheat, rye, hemp, cheese and wool. Proud of every glimpse of prosperity. Whenever she mentions an artisan, shepherd or farmer, she doesn't miss a chance to mention how significantly she improved their conditions. She also omits some topics. You hear of no tales, songs, ancestors, rituals or days of prayer. It's like listening to a tax collector. Only at the very end of her speech does she mention the wisdom of the elders, now kept in the teaching of, of the druid, who help her guide those who trust her. They heal our wounds in our gardens, she explains, but then changes the topic to all the fruit trees, hares and nuts growing in the woods. When well, she's done with it, I nod politely. We talk and talk, but I still don't know where you're from, so boring. What's your story? Have you lived in Hovlevan your entire life? What did I say at the beginning? I, th I think I said that I had a mysterious past, didn't I? Maybe we should continue. My past is buried. Let's not dig into it. After a few heartbeats, she breaks the awkwardness with a smile. And what else bothers you in the present? So what else would it take to make you consider joining? Ah, I can consider it right now. While she laughs, her eyes remain keen. But if you want me to give you some answers, let's see. She looks up and to the right, theatrically raising her hand to her chin. Some gestures of goodwill would be a great start. Since you're the guild's messenger, I need to know you can be relied on. She gives you a wide, white grin. And that's only the first step, I assume. Of course! Are you even in power to handle tax negotiations? She scoffs loudly at your head shake. Do enough for my village, and I'll hand you a beautiful signed letter. A list of all the things my neighbours are looking for, as well as what they can give in return. Your superiors are going to see more than enough to prepare their offer. She rubs her hands. I think that's fair. Yeah, looks like we're in agreement. Perfect. One more thing, though. She puts her elbows on the table, leaning closer to you. If you go behind my back, I'm not going to wait for a dagger. I'll end you first. She rests her chin against her open palms, giving you a disarmingly warm smile. I'm sure people already know that we have a new road warden. Maybe ask around if someone needs any help. The more my neighbours trust you and need you, the more willing they'll be to offer you better pay. Uh, well, let's start here. What can I do for you? Oh, so kind of you to ask. But before I ask you to run, let's see how you can walk, shall we? Her eyes wander left and right, and she gestures for a nearby guard to move away. He nods, then gestures at a few other souls to follow him. While a few of the locals cast curious looks at you, they turn away as quickly as you notice them. The mayor's shiny green eyes are still locked on you, and her voice is close to a whisper. Since Asterion's disappearance, there's little trade on the roads, and not much news reaches us. Be so kind. Her flirtatious tone distracts you with how obviously fake it is. And help me learn something, some interesting tales about our neighbours. I smile back at her. You mean ones that weren't meant to reach you? See, I knew did that deep down you're a true sage. She titters and straightens up, adjusting her cape without haste. Uh, do you have something to share? Sure. The squad that stays near the southern crossroads is now nothing more than two people, and plan to return to Hovlevan before fall. Since they cleared that camp of brigands, they went so quiet I almost forgot about them. She rubs her chin with her thumb. I'm surprised they've managed to stay alive till this day. Sending such an inexperienced group here shows that the officials misjudge this land. That's all I have to say. I keep thinking, surely city folk don't just eat wild game, salt fish and groats. Though what animals do people breed in the nearby villages? Um. Mm. 
She would say that people are eating crickets and rats. She covers her mouth. I've tasted a few rats before, of course, but crickets? How do they taste? How about a bit like nuts? But they're also ground into a flour of sorts. They're good. Purely fascinating. At least now I know that if someone serves me a plate full of insects, it's not an affront. She titters. Though I do hope they don't taste as good as mutton. I'm not going to sell our livestock cheap. Um, we could ask again if she needs assistance. Uh, bring her. So she's asking us to bring her rumours. That's fine. Um, we could go to the trader next. The man behind the counter is inspecting a sack of white flour, mumbling to himself and occasionally cursing. The other locals walk away, giving you the space to talk trade in peace. Weevils. He points at a little dark blue insect that's trying to flee. Shit me fire, it was ground a few days ago. Near pies for us tomorrow, looks like. He puts the sack on the ground. I'll take care of it later. A road warden, I. Eve the mayor cared enough to see you. And kids are lining up to look at your horse. Strangers are like ghosts to them now. I haven't quite pinned down his accent yet. Um... <laughs> He's wearing a simple brown robe with no hood, a rope instead of a belt and modest trim made of green thread. It barely reaches below his knees, revealing his sandals and crude pants made of linen. At the same time, it's way too large for him and hangs from him like a bag. He looks like a poor vendor from Hovlevan. He stands sideways to you with legs crossed, leaning on the counter with one hand and keeping the other one on his hip. He's around 40, short and a bit greasy, with a humble beard and hair. His fingers are unusually long. Uh, we could be friendly. You're a trader, I assume. I guess we'll see each other often. But you a trader for my neighbours the treasurer. Names are Kekios. And everyone brings here what they have in abundance, and I s either sell it to travellers or divide it amongst the workers, builders, artisans. These things here are near mine. He runs his eyes over the crates and barrels. But I can show you our wares if you want. But do not ask me for better prices just because you're a traveller? I need to explain myself for every deal I make, or Tice will laugh at me all the way to the pyre. Uh, anything of use for a traveller? Tis hard to say, I. What do travellers need? He clears his throat and turns away to have a look at his store. While some of the crates and barrels are empty, they carry an assortment of odds and ends. Tools made of wood and stone, pots, mugs, seeds, vegetables, fabric. It takes him a few minutes to look through the wares. He puts three packages on the countertop as he unwraps, and as he unwraps the first one, you re recognise what it is by the shape alone. Tell me this is near beauty. He chuckles and lets you hold the shiny battle axe. The haft is long, but the head is light. I know what you're thinking. Your eyes say everything. He praises the weapon loudly, but you barely listen to him. You see your reflection in the unused blade, as sharp as they get. You're not a smith, but you see not a spot of rust. When you take a swing, it takes hardly any effort. The leather straps holding the pieces together are just a decoration, and the handle is as smooth as glass and perfectly fits into your hand. The man chuckles. You like it, I? <laughs> now, I doubt you can afford it, but don't worry. That's near all I have. Look at the rest of his stuff. His long fingers tap against the parchment windows of a lantern. Its frame is cheap, made of oak. Tis glued and tis quiet. He says while shaking it in the air. Near as fancy as the iron ones with oil, but you can carry it in caves without luring all the corpse eaters and goblins. Perfect for a traveller. Just take a look. Inside the lantern you find a place for a candle. Not a great match for people living in wooden houses. Hide and glue are easy to make, but I will only ask for more than four rings. I think we might actually have that much. The last sack is as wide as a saddle and three hands tall. It contains a whole bunch of undyed linen sheets. We usually keep them for traders, but we could use a few dragon rings. And who knows if there's ever going to be a next caravan. He gives you a long look. Interested? Depends on what you want for it. So, well, we can't afford the fabric, which is more of a trade thing, I suppose. We can't afford the battle axe, but, you know, we're not a fighter anyway. But the wooden lantern, that, that could be useful. Let's take that. Uh, is he interested in anything we have? He gestures for you to gather your things. Oh, this junk does not interest me. We're looking for what we can make by ourselves, like iron or enchanted items. Uh, next time, maybe? Yeah, 
I don't have a lot right now. What can you tell me about Asterion? Oh, that Eva. That Eva, though he was. I don't understand what, what that says. Is it even? That even though he was here more than once, he didn't leave much behind. Smelly hoarder. He looks around then spits on the ground. At least he bought a blade from me. Do you remember what blade it was? Sure, this was a special one. A sickle sword with a tip wider than twas at the grip. Long as from fingertips to shoulder, near sword, near knife. Single-edged. Brought his own steel to melt for it. What good's it? For? What's it good for? Fencing? Yeah, more for cutting bushes, creepers, roots. It will nay fell a tree, but tis a fine tool. He nods to a passerby, but his smile disappears as quickly as it had shown up. Pathfinders use it. My pa used to have one as well. He chopped nuts with it. Nuts and mouflons. So he took it to the wilderness. He shrugs. Ah, pretty much anywhere. There are hills from here to the coast and bogs in the north and the heart of the woods. Can it help you with it? Uh, do you need any help? No, what? There's something urgent. I need a medicament for my daughter. Near that she's hurt or nothing. He raises his open palms as if to show that he's not holding a knife. Ah, she's a teen, wants to start hunting in the woods. Ah, can I teach her much, but I'd sleep better with her having a healing potion. You have... He hesitates. Almost nine days. Bring me the potion before the last dusk and I'll pay you five dragon rings. Uh, where can I find such a potion? Yeah, I can think of two places. Uh, the safer bed is behind old Pagos on the mountainside of the crazy monks. On the mountain of the crazy monks. Uh, crazy and boring. More boring than a mouflon, but they often brew with Numa. You can also head south, east of the crossroads, behind the pelt of the north. I've never been there myself, but you'll find a dolmen there as old as a city. And this... He reaches for his clinking pouch and pulls out a massive iron key. It's meant to open some secret passage there. How do you know about that secret? Eh, yeah, from a merchant. She's from south of Hag Hills. I was meant to pass the key to her friend, but she never showed up. We could point out that a strong elixir would be worth more than five coins. Well, now, nah, tis all I can pay. He spreads his arms. Now, don't escape, you stupid. The dragons I get here belong to the village. Five is fair pay, and I'll mention to all the neighbours how helpful you are. He takes a deep breath and adjusts his robe, still sweating. And you've just been keeping this key at your side ever since. I kept it with me trinkets and coins, that's all. Uh, we were planning to go there for years, but it's one of those things that you talk about near do it. His brief laughter turns into a cough. Fine, I'll look for it. Good, he smiles. Anything else? Did he give us the key? Uh, he did, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we got the key. So, that's east and south from that first crossroads. That, that's, that's good knowledge. Um, innkeeper. Uh, we've got three hours before dusk. It feels like a little bit early to go to bed. <laughs> um, I don't have any money for any tailoring, so I'm out. Well, mind you, we need to ask people if we can help them, don't we? You follow the guard's directions and reach the whitewashed building standing on the western bank, next to a small garden of flowers and herbs. It's well kept and clean, with a plain, beaten front yard, in parts covered with sand. Through the open windows you catch a glance of the furniture, made of smooth, almost shiny wood, with hints of dark, cherry-like red, decorated with carvings of plants. A woman in her forties is sitting on a wooden bench. The table is covered with fabrics, threads, and needles made of bone and iron. She's sewing a long sleeve to what's going to become a blue tunic. Her movements are quick and confident. Her brown, wavy, shoulder-length hair is tied into a wreath-like braid. But other than that, her clothes are simple and inconspicuous. She doesn't have a left leg, but you don't notice any cane. You observe her for a few moments until, without sparing you so much as a glance, she encourages you to speak with a grunt. Uh, I'm looking for a tailor. You found one? Her voice is low and she doesn't stop her work. Name's Beon. Could you answer some questions? Uh, the boredom in her voice is palpable. I'm near Bard. Um, okay, well, we don't really have any money, so we'll just leave her alone if she doesn't need help. Go to the priests. 
You head south of the dead tree in the main square. Before you get to the second thatched building, a large man stands up from a bench and gets in your way. He's close to 50, taller than most of the people you've seen in your life, broad-shouldered. His hair and short brown beard are brown. Did I say? His hair and short beard are brown, matching his elegant woolen robe. A thick club is attached to his right wrist with a leather strap. He left his sandals by a sitting spot. Many want to speak with our guides and teachers. He speaks with a solemn, strong voice. But you need welcome here. Turn back, stranger. Can I know why? You can. He swings his polished heavy weapon. You're from the outside and can near be trusted. The boars and slaves of the United Church would crush us if they had a chance. Before we allow you to spy on us, we need to be sure it is worth it. I'm your new road warden. Are you sure that no soul here needs my assistance? His harsh look softens. We can handle ourselves. If that changes, Elpis will summon you. I don't want any trouble. He shrugs. Travelers bring their problems onto others. Their will means nothing. I'm not a spy. I don't believe you. So be it. I turn back. Um. Okay. So it's too late in the day for locals to speak to us. Let's go and speak to the innkeeper then. Maybe we can get a room. Uh, even though the counter stands outdoors, it's not rotten or dirty, and you guess that like the other furniture, it's brought inside every night. Eric's approaches you with a smile and leans on its surface with his fists. He's portly and even taller than his neighbours. He's got freckles, short grey hair and an elegant beard. His long woolen orange tunic has a decorative cut right under the neck and loose braids at the edges. How can I help you, stranger? His accent is heavy, nothing like his wife's. He stomps with a heavy boot and looks around as if he's just waiting to get back to his other tasks. His fingers are still dirty from weeding the garden. Uh, do you have any rumours to share? Rumours? Nah, really. I have my own things to worry about. Neighbours keep their own company. Better for everyone to seek help from a wife or the forest speakers. Nah, in a mug of ale. Uh, someone might need my help? You say it as if we expect travellers to get here any day now. I'll ask around. Come tomorrow. Any interesting guests? I don't know. He scratches his beard. There was one vagabond, but he was not here for long. And didn't he do much? Timid fellow. Talks loudly, but's afraid of everything, especially the guards. His face is touched by flames. Has a big ballista. He says this word with a strange accent, smirking. And a large bird is his beast of burden. I don't know what to say. He shrugs. He went south and is most likely gone. I might be able to buy a ration. I think we've rid of some. Ah, keep them in the hall. Smoked mutton, a sack of dried fruits, nuts, biscuits. We eat fresh here and pay with work. Coins are never worth much. When he thinks his lips move as well. Let's say one ring for enough food to fill you for two days. In Hovlevan, that kind of price would buy you three, even four times as much food. If you're in a mood for spending, I also have something special. Just give me a minute. He goes upstairs and returns with a small wooden box and a hand-long leather sheath. Just a teeth set. You're afraid of what he's going to show you, but when he opens the box, you may realize he meant teeth cleaning. See? He points at three different compartments. Salt, cloves, and mint. You mix whatever you want here. The fourth holds only a small pestle made of polished stone. And here are the twigs you need. They'll last for months. Seeing you're not convinced, he takes a deep breath. Well, we're doing a lead outside as bead in our creek. But give me two dragons and I'll ask my kids to get you in shape. You'll get a tub with soap and rose oil and they'll wash your clothes in water. I'll cook you something nice, as much as you can eat. Unfortunately, I don't have that much. Alright, we'll buy a bit more food. So we're out of gold. I could use a room, hopefully free. Uh, it's getting late, better look for a safe place to sleep. Well, I think I've just done that. Ah, sure thing, he nods. My kids keep it cleaner than you'd find in the city. Just tell me when you're ready. Thanks. All right, so we're going to sleep. And what can we do? Okay, well, we can't rent anything. We spent all our money. Um, so sleeping on a mouflon pelt. There's a lot of noise outside, and you can sense a heavy, unpleasant smell coming from the cauldron. At least the fur is fluffy, and you can cover yourself with your blanket. 
So we're going to uh, recharge some magic by the look of it. Uh, so plus magic, minus food, minus cleanliness. Um, okay, well, not much we can do about that. Your first sleep ends, but your usual one hour break is instantly disrupted by noise. You stand up, walk to the window and see the reason for the commotion. A group of workers is just outside the inn, drinking and laughing. Eric's the innkeeper is also among them. You could join them, but if you do so, you won't get a good sleep tonight, and after such a long day, you may end up exhausted. Yeah, let's, okay, let's join him. <clears throat> you lose track of time, surrounded by the smells of old ale and cold roast lamb. The excuse for having the celebration is the recent birth, the very same that was occurring when you arrived at the village. The young mother is exhausted and is the first one to leave, but more than ten people stay around, poking at her partner with kind-hearted jokes. Use the next week the best you can, says one of them. Nay, sleep for you after that. You may be a stranger, but your presence is welcomed with joy. The small talk is just as engaging as you'd expect from people who have already slept for three to four hours today, but there's something pleasant about them sharing their parenthood stories and plans for the future. The humming of Howlers Creek and the lights in the dark make you feel as if you belong here, and that's a delightful illusion, especially in a group of strangers. At one point you're asked about your own journeys, though you prefer to keep most of them to yourself. One of the hunters encourages you strongly to travel to creeks. Ah, oh, they're a fun bunch, you see. They love to meet new people, but be ready to wake up with a spinning head. I'm one of the first people to go back to bed. Creeks is the village in the Far East, isn't it, that we were told about. Okay, it's warm here, but the mouflon skin allows your back to rest a bit. You wake up a couple of times during the night. The smell of the cook's stew fuels your hunger, and the staff returns to the room once every hour or so to stir the pot. You wake up early, but leave the building to check up on Roach and give it water from the creek. The innkeeper is sitting near the door, from time to time carrying out another bowl with either stew or gruel. Tice is nowhere to be seen. Let me leave the square. Um, this might be something we can get paid for. Let's offer my services to the guards. A group of workers is going to explore the forest garden, seeking wooden mushrooms. You'll ride ahead looking out for threats. The task will make you will take you about half a day and may get dangerous. I'm gonna get one coin for it. Uh, tell you what, before we agree to that, um, how do I eat? Where's my inventory? Ah, eat a yeah, okay, yeah. I should I should be doing this. So eat a food ration. I might even do two. Um, so we've got four rations left, but we've got a full stomach, and that's good. So let's offer services to the guards. We're going to um, get paid for a bit of work. It turns out you don't have much to do. You get your job done quickly and with little difficulty. But very dirty. Um, can we just use our soap? <laughs> Is it? Oh wow, did we use it already? I thought we'd have it for a little while. I guess it's used up. It's a shame, we're extremely dirty. Well, I think what we'll do, you can see we've made a little bit of progress today. I think what we're going to do is we're going to travel back down to the ruins here. I think if we click on it we might even go directly there. And then we'll escort the scavenger to the Pelt of the North. And from there, we're going to head east and south and get to that dolmen where there might be uh, a secret place to get in and get the healing potion uh, for Howler's Dell, the, uh, the trader there, who will give us uh, some money. And then from there, I think we'll you know head off either west or north. Uh, but we'll leave that for the next episode. And so we're going to leave it here for today. I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks very much for watching. Uh, if you did enjoy it, then please do hit the like button on the video and subscribe to the channel as well. That'd be amazing. And in the meantime, I hope to see you again for more Road Warden. Bye for now.